Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. I know we've got a, quite a few people online as well as people in the room. Um, so thank you very much for joining us on this nice um, hot Brisbane day. With um, And so all those photographers out there are clearly for us. All those people running around looking starstruck. They're just hoping to catch a glimpse of a university librarian or a librarian of some kind. I'm pretty sure that's what it's all about. Um, so, uh, I wanted to start um, by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which QUT now stands and recognise that these have always been places of teaching and learning and that these lands have never been ceded. I want to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play both within the QUT community and the places of learning at which we all work. I'd like to extend this acknowledgement of country to the places where the webinar participants are now standing as well. So um, thank you very much um, for QUT for hosting yet again um, at the University Librarians Forum. Um, it's always a really um, fun day. You, we always have an amazing speaker and today is no exception. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing Robin speak um, later on today. Um, and uh, before I get started on the actual program, um, if there is an emergency situation that occurs, um, QT asks that you respond to any directions that you're given and that you leave the building following the standard exit signs. Um, if you need bathrooms, behind the door there or out that door and along the corridor are the bathrooms if you haven't found them already, but I'm pretty sure lots of you will have been to forums in this building and, and had to find them before. Um, very importantly, because it's a librarian event, there'll be lots of people tweeting. So the Twitter hashtag for today is hashtag ULForum18. Um, so UL Forum 18, get that up. And then the other thing that we're doing again, which we have also done before, is using Slido for comments and questions. Um, if you can obviously ask comments and questions in the room or on Slido if you're in the room and, and you prefer that forum. Um, so just go to Slido and then the, um, the uh, um, Slido tag is hashtag UL Forum 18 as well. So same as the Twitter hashtag. Um, so what we're doing today is um, I'll give a report about QLOX activities for the year. Um, Robin Mays is our guest speaker for today and then we'll have our working party, party convener and mentor presentations which about a dozen of you are really have been doing lots of work on up to this point. Um, so last year um, we were looking at disruption and how disruption leads to innovation. And this year, we thought that resilience would be a really relevant theme for us because um, when you are living through disruption, as we all are in, in every organisation and in this, um, this age, there's always um, disruption, there's always change, there's always challenges. And one of the ways that we deal with those is developing our resilience, either our professional resilience, the resilience of our organisations to those changes that sometimes are imposed upon us or out of our control. Sometimes we're making those um, challenges ourselves. Um, and so what we thought, was that, um, that today would be really interesting to explore how um, the um, various people within the QLOC community um, develop their resilience and also the expertise of our, um, our guest speaker will explore that topic as well. Um, our posters out in the, um, in the cube area are uh, exploring various, various um, uh, res responses to that theme as well. So we've got um, people with posters about um, how to deal in deal with um, you know financially constrained times. How to be innovative when you've got challenges um, confronting you. So I really recommend when we get to that part of the day, um, having a look at those posters and seeing what people have said. So for the convener's report, this is my first year as convener um, and it has been really fun, mostly thanks to Rachel, who's just an awesome executive officer. Um, so I'm really pleased to report on a few things that um, QLOC has done this year. So firstly, and I always joke about this is my legacy, is that um, we rebranded QLOC. We put, <laughs> we put a plus sign in there, and but the rebrand is really pretty beautiful. Um, so that, so the rebrand is really about 
um, incorporating the, the um, QLOC members who are not just Queensland members. Um, if you look through what we um, started with, um, those three links um, that you can see at the bottom of the screen actually came from Bulock when it was three university lib libraries. You can see someone got the sewing machine out early on in QLOC's um, uh, history, obviously. But we've been through a, free, a few different um, iterations of what QLOC branding looks like. Um, until we get to this. And this is the other new thing that we did this year, which is the new QLOC website as well. So you can see the QLOC branding. It's so, it's really clean. Um, it's it's um, uh, really modern. And then we also moved um, off the wiki onto a new website. So that was um, a great opportunity to try to do something um, different with the website, get more functionality and kind of less, a uh, more clean um, look to it. Um, Rachel's done a great job moving us over there. The working parties have done great work in adjusting to those new ways of sharing information and, um, and dealing with the website and the files and that kind of stuff. The other thing that we did um, is introduced um, the concept of giving donations to the Indigenous Literacy Foundation rather than speakers gifts for a lot of our um, activities this year. So that makes um, life more administratively easy for Rachel for one, but it also makes QLOC give back to the community in ways that are really um, uh, meaningful for the um, QLOC members. So we're really happy to be doing that. The other thing that QLOC's done for the last few years is the professional development scholarships. This is um, something that's really important and it makes a big difference, particularly in those financially challenging times that a lot of us have, um, where you're able to apply for a scholarship through QLOC to um, attend some training or a, a conference or do something to do with your professional development. And people have done a, a range of things with their scholarships. Um, over the last year. So we gave eight scholarships um, this year and six of them, um, the um, scholarship winners have given a presentation um, that's also on the QLOC um, YouTube site. Um, you can see there's a quite a range of things that people have done with them and people really enjoyed the um, professional development where they reported back on what they'd done with their scholarships. Um, and also for some participants in particular, getting this scholarship means the difference between going to something or, or um, participating in something and not. And it's real, and so it's really valuable for kind of that, uh, just boosting people's ability to um, take control of their own professional development. I really encourage people who are thinking about it to take the opportunity and apply for a professional development scholarship. There aren't many opportunities. Um, well, there are actually quite a number of opportunities, I guess, in your worlds to, to find money to help your meagre library budgets to deal with um, professional development. But this is one of them. And, and I really recommend you, um, you try um, for a scholarship. Another, um, oh, so, those, um, those presentations are on our YouTube website as well. Another really important piece of work that happened this year, oh, from 2017 actually. So in 2017, um, Universities Australia um, released uh, an Indigenous strategy 2017 to 2020. And in response, QLOC decided that it would um, convene an Indigenous strategy reference group to examine what um, practices and approaches might be relevant to QLOC member libra libraries um, in response response to that Universities Australia um, strategy. So that group's been meeting most months and it's been a really successful group. Um, it's come up with um, some really interesting approaches to student and researcher support and it's developing a toolkit that QLOC members can use to assess their maturity in this space and to give them ideas about things that they might be able to do within their own organisations to, um, to progress that strategy. Um, so that group's going to continue through um, 2019 and that group also has a beautiful poster outside in the cube. So you can see that up close um, after um, the forum itself when over drinks. Um, and so really the heart of QLOC are the working party and practitioner groups. So those people and many of you are in the room today um, do an incredible job of 
meeting, hosting webinars, sharing information and, and ideas, um, doing all kinds of workshops. So the workshops, for instance, that we've had this year are a workshop on storytelling for leaders. Um, we had just this morning a three things for career resilience um, workshop. There's a um, really good um, session um, on open education resources and practice practices. There's been lots and lots of webinars and what, that's a really nice progression of how QLOC does things over the last few years is the increase in the number of webinars that allow anybody from any location to participate fully in the, the work of the working parties. Um, so there have been webinars on a variety of topics as well. Um, there was a forum on e-textbooks um, and we also regularly do that technology and library survey which a lot of people across the country find really interesting as well. So core really finds that um, a really valuable survey that, um, that QLOC puts together as well. So um, well done to those um, working parties. Um, those, um, a lot of those webinars are not just viewed by QLOC members either. So a lot of them are viewed, uh, participated, the participants come from internationally or interstate as well. So it's a, uh, it's a much broader service that QLOC's able to give to the library community through those working parties. Um, so the theme of um, today, as I said, um, is resilience and our um, guest speaker is Associate Professor Robin Mays from QUT. Um, I'm really excited to have Robin um, talk to us today when Rachel and I had a, um, a Zoom meeting with her earlier, um, I was like, this is, is really perfect for us. So Robin's research um, is um, around human geography and gender. Um, and she works in the QT Business School in the Work Industry Research Program. So her work has contributed to understandings of corporate social responsibility, organisational behaviour and labour mobility, grounded in extensive work on social, organisation, organisational and geopolitical dimensions of mining in Australia. She's currently researching paid work in digital platforms as part of an ARC grant, and she also explores the social and cultural geographies of all pairs in Australia. And those of you who've been watching the news today know there's lots of work to be done around how all pairs are treated um, in Australia. So she's published her work in over 40 journal articles and book chapters. She's regularly invited to speak at a range of national and international fora, and we are really grateful for her coming to speak to us today. Well, thank you everyone. I am genuinely delighted to be here, mainly because I love libraries and of course I do, I'm an academic. And so much of my whole professional life and also my broader intellectual life revolves around libraries and librarians. And of course, as we've just heard, thank you very much, you know, you, you do a large amount of strategic work that far exceeds my narrow personal kind of engagements with libraries and appreciations, but all of which is important, I guess, in terms of the larger, the larger idea around the protection and access to and maintenance of knowledge networks and knowledge forms. So I am delighted to be here and um, to speak with you. I also am keen to talk about resilience with you, partly because, of course, the library system, particularly the university library system, which I've been able to witness over my decades of involvements in universities, has undergone significant technological change. And as many of you are aware and have experienced yourself, this technological change has often been quite hectic, I imagine, and far reaching. So just having a look at some of your discussion papers more recently, it's clear that the work and experience in, um, of university libraries has been shaped through significant technological change, including digital disruption, which moves into all aspects of your work. So your ways of working, the provision of services, for example, have been profoundly affected, as have the ideas of what constitutes the library, for example, in the challenge of the notion of the virtual library. So we can't even point to a specific building anymore and be confident that is the library. New and emerging priorities uh, come to the fore all the time and as, if, as has already been noted, all these changes and this disruption continues to occur in times of constrained resources. And it's the, uh, the, the usual kind of context. So in this brief presentation, what I want to do is I want to think a little bit about resilience with you. Uh, resilience is a topic that I've just started to come to in terms of my work around digital platform work, because much of the disruption that occurs has, 
has been grounded in notions of digital technology and what it does as a technology. But often we are not thinking about what does change mean or how might change impact on different people. So I guess my starting point then is that change and digital disruption is hugely diverse. So lots of different people are affected in different ways and it's not always the same people who are required to be resilient, for example. So what I wanted to do here was explore the notion of resilience, perhaps in the context of my own work on digital platforms, but also um, in a way that I hope allows you then to draw parallels to your work, which of course you are best placed to do. So, you know, it'd be interesting then for us to have a discussion afterwards about how some of these ideas of resilience may or may not um, impact on your views of resilience in your experiences in the university. At the same time, of course, I want to try and challenge the notion of resilience a bit. So this is a more high level discussion of what resilience might be and how we might think about it rather than a how to or what I think anyone should or should not do. Um, let me see. If, um, here we go. I should be able to move along. So I will return to this image on this front slide in a little while. And you'll see here I've called this presentation Resilience, Technology and Change because I wanted to put resilience at the front and then try to use that as a lens to understand technology and then change. So if we move on to begin to think about the notion of resilience, resilience is everywhere. You only have to type it into Google and it turns up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times in many different variations. So it is a concept, a framework and a tool that we could argue has considerable traction and popularity and there's good reason for it at this point. So of course we've always practiced resilience. The human species would not be here at all. Most of us would not have any kind of life unless we were some sort of um, resilience was part of our character. So while resilience has always been around, I'm seeing the kind of emphasis on resilience as a response to particular um, normally highly dangerous or threat situations, for example. And these are images that just pop up when you uh, search for the word resilience. And I think these images tell us a lot about how resilience is being positioned in the broader social context. I find it fascinating how many images are of the, the lone plant bursting through, you know, a post-apocalyptic landscape and resilience will help us come back in that way. I also think it's interesting in terms of the way that we have individual resilience and also organisational resilience, which I'll talk to you about a little bit more in a moment. And, and some of the ways that we have basic philosophies of what resilience is as a form of coping. So this very um, well-known phrase, you know, fall down seven times, but stand up eight. So these are, these are very kind of aspirational and inspirational underpinnings of the idea of resilience. As I've said, resilience does have an individual and also an organisational component. In terms of the individual component, as many of you are aware, it tends to focus on very particular individual characteristics that we should encourage in ourselves and others. For example, confidence but particularly confidence in your ability to handle change, your belief that things will turn out well, along with your ability to enjoy change and challenge, your capacities for emotional regulation, so to keep your emotions under control as you engage with change and seek to have um, some kind of impact, and also that you should have support seeking strategies. Within organisational resilience, we see a bit of a shift here. So the idea then is that it's a dynamic kind of process which might involve a number of individuals. But I'm interested in the term positive adaptation within the context of significant adversity. And it is this notion of positive ad uh, adaptation that I think we need to concentrate on. In terms of organisational resilience, it was first used and is still largely used to refer to the way in which organisations need to respond to what is seen as a rapidly changing business environment. So successful organisations and libraries, for example, are those who understand the dynamic nature of their businesses. They understand the competitors, the technology, the availability and cost of finance, the resources, and they understand that they have to be able to not only be willing, but also be able to adapt to sudden and large changes. And this is in part where we get the narrative around agility and flexibility of organisations. So the resilient organisation will retain an ability to achieve its long-term strategic goals, though it may fail to meet some of its short-term organisational targets. So some of this, I argue, depersonalises 
and dehumanises in many ways what resilience is and how we practice it and why we need to do it. And part of my aim here today was to try to rehumanise some of these elements. One way of doing that is to think about how other people have started to use resilience and some of you will be aware of the Sydney Resilience Strategy which is part of a global resilience uh, city strategy and Penrith Council for example recently released their resilience strategy. What's interesting here is the way that resilience thinking is seen to provide opportunities not only to respond to events and situations but also to enhance long term environmental, social and economic outcomes. So now we, we begin to see the generative dimensions of resilience. So a way to contribute to creating a better, more equal future, if you like. And supporting that, of course, is their first direction, which at least on paper emphasises that this kind of resilience will include communities in decision making. Because in part, resilience is a very political act and it is about who has to change, who gets a voice about what will change and who then can manage whether or not that is successful change. Another dimension that I think is interesting to observe, and we can see this coming out of the original biological and ecosystems grounding of resilience. It's the capacity of a system <clears throat> to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change so as to retain essentially the same function, structure and identity. And here is where I think it's most interesting to think about the management of resilience as large organisations and as individuals. It is the idea then that you should think about how the underlying function and identity might be changed by new forms. So new forms of technology are one thing, but what do they do to the actual function that you provide? And in this sense, these two things are separated. The idea is that you can change the form. So you might have, you know, digital repositories of academic papers, for example, but the actual function will be the same, right? And in a moment, we might problematize whether or not that actually works. So in this bigger notion of resilience, we can see the idea of form, function and identity and how they might be related in the organisation. And a good way to think about this and one that I can refer to with more confidence because it is my research area is, is the notion of digital platform work. Digital work, paid work in the digital economy is a classic example of uh, extensive, sudden and profound change for many industries and also many employees. It represents in many ways a new form of work and a new way of organising work. It can be observed in numerous industries encompassing tasks that can be executed or communicated online and this is where we think about graphic design for example or programming and it can also encompass real work uh, tasks such as driving, cleaning, nursing, food delivery and so on. We're all familiar with companies such as Freelancer, Uber, Deliveroo and Mechanical Turk and how they act as intermediaries between workers and end users. Work may be performed by a specific individual, for example, or split into smaller tasks and divided amongst a cloud of workers. And they're just some of the ways in which we might think that this work then gives us the capacity to um, extend the dehumanisation of tasks into smaller and smaller tasks, which sits in contrast to many ideas about digital work as meaning no one will have to do the drudge work. This will be done, you know, by technology. This leads me to the common kind of interpretations of digital work and the digital economy, which are either classically utopian or dystopian interpretations. The uberization of work, as some people have called it, is purported to provide a range of benefits to a range of different people. And I want to point out that often the benefits are not specified in terms of who particularly will benefit. Rather, there is seen to be a kind of neutral and apolitical worker who will benefit. It's about the enhancement of IT skills, so it's an opportunity to develop those. It's often seen to be providing an opportunity for those who don't have access to the labour market to engage in paid work and earn an income. Often uh, the people cited there are those with disabilities. It's also about having greater autonomy, work-life balance and flexibility for some people. And this autonomy and flexibility is much muchly focused, I think, on the capacity to have control over your total hours and when and where you work. Though, as we have seen from disputes in the press, for example, and as is the case with au pairs, that I am happy to talk about, au pairs themselves lack this kind of capacity for control over total number of working hours. The kinds of risks that emerge in the digital economy. 
include, include things such as insecure employment. And this is largely because of the notion of on-demand labour. So lots of the work is precisely on-demand. You need to be always willing to work, always available to work, in order to take up the opportunities that emerge. There is rising wage inequality from widening gaps in terms of uh, performance and the demand for skills. Exploitation and lack of autonomy is powerfully illustrated, I argue, in recent court cases and protests around Uber and around Deliveroo and so on. Platform work also increases competition between workers who need to compete in terms that are called begging and bragging to achieve uh, access to particular tasks. It, it decreases the skill level of many tasks by breaking them down into smaller and smaller tasks and it also involves a spatial, temporal and psychological blurring of home and work. We are well aware of the way in which digital technologies have changed those relationships as has occurred in the library. Now, while much of the platform work literature that is very supportive of this, or I would argue very uncritically supportive, makes a lot of um, a big deal about the degree of control that people have in this environment, it's important to note, for example, that the platform economy makes wide use of what has been widely referred to as the algorithmic management. Algorithmic management is used by many companies in a variety of ways. And what it means is that we can use software applications then to track, evaluate and instruct a crowd of casual workers. So workers you do not directly employ according to the current law so that they deliver a responsive, seamless and standardised service. It is used in terms of ratings, metrification, and I think a good example of this is Deliveroo, in which riders have 30 seconds to pick up an invitation to pick up food. So these kinds of standards can be imposed in a way that is not accidental, because of course the reason that these technologies can disrupt current, current capital and current markets is because they allow a greater control over a more flexible and widely available workforce. And I have a lovely example, I think, of this, and we can think about this in return to form, function and identity, of what I call Joe Little's burger. So Joe Little is a colleague of mine who came to visit from the UK, and we were staying in a hotel here in Brisbane City, and she ordered a burger and had it delivered by Deliveroo. When we were sitting on the balcony, we, we saw the driver arrive, so she went down to get the burger so it would be nice and hot, right? So when she got downstairs, what do you think happened? The driver said, you can't have your burger yet. And she said, but there it is, and it's getting cold. And he said, no, I can't give it to you yet because the minute you sign for it, that will say how long it took me to deliver it to here. And if that keeps happening, that will shrink down the amount of time we actually have to deliver. So, you know, so this is, I think, a nice example of the contradictions of the way that we're asked to think about change in terms of the digital economy, but also to think about form, function and identity. So we might think here that, you know, the function here is the quick delivery of service. And what's changed in terms of the form is that it can be digitally managed by an, an app that mediates that. But at the same time, people then have to cope with those extra levels of control and that rising constriction of standards. And they do this in very individual ways by making sure they wait as long as possible to not reduce the overall time that they have. So while we might think that digital platforms in one sense give us greater access to work opportunities, they also have the capacity for greater uh, work intensification and also for greater pre-selection of workers. So if we think about their function then as providing opportunities as a form of a labour market, how might the form of them as a digital platform change that function? And it can change that function in far reaching ways. So for example, Mechanical Turk can advertise on the part of large companies who are requesting a crowd work um, group of labour, they can request a very particular audience and they can do this. They can select who will see the advertisement for the work based on a number of criterion. They can do it based on the person's past successes, their kind of rating score, if you like, but they can also do it according to geographical location, which thus allows them to filter for presumed cultural competencies, but also to filter, of course, for areas where um, there may be differences in um, in exchange rates, which means you can pay less and people will be more willing to do the work, etc. So these kinds of things can be managed in very, very careful and invisible ways. 
So the point here, I guess, is that neutral uh, neutrality of digital technologies is, is a fallacy, and we should think about the way that digital technologies are designed and used and have very political consequences and outcomes. They're not neutral um, in, in the sense that it's how we use them that makes a difference. So we can see then that while digital work does indeed offer some benefits for some people at the same time, it doesn't. And I think one further example might be a gendered example of entrepreneurship. So at another level, digital platforms are seen to encourage people to be able to um, realise their own business ideas, have very simple business models, people can work from home and become entrepreneurs or self-employed. Now, while that's one option that arises from this technology, it is increasingly becoming an expectation, as a lot of government policy will show. But at the same time, what it might do then is it might enable women to work from home, for example. All right, so this then means that the digital capabilities, the network capabilities, allow then for work to be happening at home. So it's a different kind of form, but also a different function, I would argue. Because what has happened then is a lot of women now working from home in this way, and they are now invisible in the larger labour market. And by working from home, what, what happens, as the research has convincingly shown, many of them then end up working much longer hours and have to take on the burden of care as is usual, but not in ways where it can be collaboratively deflected or reorganised. So it's not about just the technology uh, in terms of, for example, how we use it in libraries, but who gets to use it, how they use it and why they might use it in different ways. So how do I link that back together to these ideas of resilience and form function and identity? And, and this is where I think when we want to think about resilience, to move beyond uh, individual changes or individual capacities and how we might make ourselves more malleable in terms of external change. It is also about trying to think about the, distin the distinction. So when something changes, to what extent does the change in form affect its function is something we have to keep at the forefront of what we're thinking about. And that often does not happen. Most of the literature is in fact just about how do you become more resilient, how do organisations protect themselves from unexpected change. So I think that resilience can be seen in more complex ways. At the same time, because I am an academic and this is my job, I want to tell you too that I actually don't believe that form and function can be separated. So I think that once you change the form, you also change the function. And I think this is what we have to also try to keep in mind as a more complex environment that we work in. And then finally, because I have talked at you a fair bit here, um, I was hoping you might have some ideas about why why I have this image on my opening slide and on my final slide. Thank you. Uh, this is a, the form and function may have changed from what I imagine was just a blank wall to perhaps a canvas that still retains the function of the wall. Yeah, brilliant. That's that's exactly right. Thank you. And so it's those sorts of far-fetched metaphors I like. You know, may, maybe we're stretching the bow here, but they allow us to think a little bit differently and perhaps a little bit more innovatively in the um, original sense of the word. So I think this particular street art, which is in Valparaiso, a city in Chile that was suffering from, you know, a loss of economic opportunity and wanted to turn to tourism, began to invite street artists in. And as you just said, the street artists then can show a form of coping with this new environment by A, leaving a very complex and interesting mark on public buildings, which then um, are also private structures that were built with a particular form and a particular content, but now have been changed by these coping strategies to be something more interesting and perhaps uh, to allow other voices and other uh, spaces to emerge. So I guess my key point here then is to take away the idea that we are living in a digital era, what some people have said, as the second machine age, the new digital era, and that change is fast and quick, but we need to think about the politics of that change and use the politics of that change to help us understand what our resilience should in fact look like. Thank you. So thank you very much for that. Does, do we have any questions on Slido yet? Or do you want me to just swap over to Slido? Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Anyone want to? 
engage or So we're making a lot of digital changes in libraries, but have we made real changes to the way we work in libraries? Or are we kind of still keeping that structure and, and not really thinking about whether the, the type of work, the way that we work could or should change? Uh, not that I can speak for my current organisation because it's been two weeks, uh, but from my past experience quite recently in the UK, what a lot of libraries and especially academic libraries are doing is using technology as an enabler to just perhaps widen the reach of the existing ways of working and resources, but very much come at it from the traditional create the service, make it available, rather than creating a new type of service with the digital, making it born digital, basically, um, or making it born within the technology. So mm. I think, however, at Griffith, we're on our way to making that change now, hopefully. Excellent. Thank you. So can I just say perhaps as an outsider how it, how it looks to me when I go into the library? You know, I've used libraries for many decades. And as I said, you know, I, I believe very strongly in libraries. Um, and I've enjoyed, enjoyed myself in libraries for a long, long time. I've been told off in them too. But I think that libraries do look very different to me. The kind of people I see at the front desk are no longer librarians necessary that I would recognise as librarians perhaps. They're people who are brought in to offer a more agile service. I actually think of some of the terminology I've seen for um, a, a very particular demographic of users, so the way that students might use it and students conceived as very young people. I've noticed from my own work that digital archives, certainly it's fantastic. I can get a paper in the middle of the night and read it and have it just like that. But if there's a problem with the technology, I can't. If it's too old, it's hard to find. If I want to actually read a book, I can't read the book. I need to try and read a digital version, which does change how I practice. But it means that the face of the library looks different. I do go into the library less often than I have in the past. And also, I feel that, that there is a general concern, certainly in the academic community, that there are now digital access barriers that weren't there when I first began to use libraries. So anyone could walk into a library and I could pick up any book and I could go to the stacks and read whatever I want. But increasingly, I find students, for example, who want to take up postgraduate study come to me and say, here's my proposal. I say, oh, I'll read some academic literature and come back with a richer proposal and we'll see where you might go. And they say, but I can't access the papers. You know, so they can through Google Scholar, of course, to some extent. But you can see the access is different. In the past, you'd have just gone into the library. So th these are very broad ways that it looks different to me. And I don't know how it might feel different to you working. Does it seem friendlier? Does it seem friendlier? <clears throat> yes and no, actually. Mm. Bits of it feel, feel less friendly. Yeah, I think this is my very personal experience. And um, you, I find that sometimes you go into a library and there is a sense that you should not be asking anybody anything. You should have been able to work it out. I'm not saying people are saying this to me or that I meet unfriendly staff. What I'm saying is I have a sense that, oh, it's digital, you know, I should have been able to work out where this is or what to do with that. If I can't get it, you know, why can't I find it? And also unfriendly in terms of the technology and the way that you can go and use an interface for quite a long time. The interface can be changed overnight. And that's how it seems to us. And you come back and you think, oh my God, what is this browsing? So you have to learn all over again how to use it. So, hmm. And those are two, those two really important points about that, that you know, paywall that we all know about that, that people hit and that librarians hate um, having in their lives. And that's that, that disruption that's happened to us, hmm. which we don't have as much control over as we would like. And that's where right, you know, right now there's that big movement to try and get uh, get over that that paywall issue that we have mm -hmm. um, but the other thing is is when you're looking at 
access to information, there's the, the digital divide thing that still happens, Absolutely. you know. For I remember a few years ago, um, our previous vice chancellor were talking about that the great dividing range is also the digital divide. You're on this side of it, you've got technology, you've got connectivity, you go over the other side of the mountain and it takes four times as long to download a, a, um, a page on the internet. The, the access, you know, you would um, know as well, Anthony, you know, different places that your students work and live and try and access your material have much different experiences. So when we have this much change, it impacts different people in different ways. Um, and sometimes we're so privileged with the way, the access that we have, that sometimes we forget what it's like to not have this amount of information and digital privilege that we take for all every day. Mm. I think so. And I think that must make a difference to how it feels to work in the library, the way that the physical space of the library has changed, the kinds of spaces that are available now, um, the way that connectivity might be emphasised over other forms of sociality. That's how it seems to me as an outsider. Hmm. An insider, outsider, of course. And then for our students, the types of world that they go into will be very different. So how do we help prepare them well for that? work in terms of the, the way that our spaces are structured and the way our services are provided is that, you know, what do we have to change about what we do in order to prepare students well for that new way of working that they might encounter? Hmm. And just, um, I think that makes enormous sense. However, it also means that it, we are likely to be very reactive so this is how it is, how do we help them? Mm. And, and what I wanted to try and do was emphasise that resilience can also be used as a proactive change mechanism. So you might say, well, we don't, we don't think it should be that way, or there will be people left out of the way that is, and we will try to find other ways then to, to work that don't just follow. I'm not saying that you do just follow, but that is part of the larger narrative, isn't it? Stuff changes out there, we have to, we have to cope and adapt. I just think maybe some of our coping and adapting should be pushing back. Do you think that, uh, sorry, just out of general interest, do you think that there, that this move toward uh, algorithmic management should be taught perhaps to everyone, like in terms of social studies, basically, in terms of kids coming up from high school, getting a job with Uber when they're like 17, 18, um, as opposed to the classic pizza delivery driver job, which is very straightforward and easy to understand. You go in, you deliver the pizza and you get paid by the pizza company. Um, whereas this algorithm with algorithm, algorithmic management, uh, you have to sort of almost work out the system in order to be employed. And there's no assistance in working out that system anymore. Mm -hmm. That's That's a very good observation about the way that you you have to work out the system and that's what workers have been doing all along isn't it? it's part of the the effort bargain is is trying to figure out what is required of you how to avoid over exploitation how to work the system in many ways i think people should be taught more about this i mean that the current research that we've been doing out of the arc project is very much about the way that work in the digital economy, not all of the digital economy, and this is the other thing, you know, Uber is one very specific example, as is Deliveroo. They're not generic in that sense. Um, but if we take those two examples, there is um, clear evidence that people see it as something that enables cheaper, cheaper cab rides, more accessible, if you like, easy weekend work and so on. And we adapt to that kind of new technology and, and we use it. However, we have to think more critically about what that technology actually involves. And we've all seen the surcharging, for example, when it's rainy or when it's busy. So it is not necessarily a well-regulated space where you will always get a decent price too. People who work in it part-time often say how much they like it for the flexibility, but it is at this time an addition to other income yet it will become in the future the sole income for many people. The digital 
technology and the capacities to collect information and to organise it algorithmically is largely not understood. And we've been doing research with uh, groups of young people who sign up to do work on many platforms and they do not read the terms and conditions. They do not understand their protections or lack of protections. Also, we are failing to see here in terms of the form and the function, the way that the, the form of work mediated by digital platform actually changes the function of work away from something that provides a decent livable decent job for people to something that no longer has this basic social protections we expect so no superannuation you have no uh, health insurance you're seen as a regular contractor etc so these dimensions are not always evident so most certainly we should think a bit more about the black box of that technology and one thing that struck me actually is that there's this uh, parallel with the way academics have to understand the algorithms of the system and the game they have to play um, and when they're you know understanding the terms and conditions of where they publish and, mm -hmm. and how they um, create their research profile and that kind of stuff it's it's not algorithms aren't aren't only for delivery drivers no exactly they they shape much more of the world of work that's a really good point about how this happens yeah so i do have to think about that i'm not very good at it yet but i do have to think about where i publish how long it is before something's unembargoed or whatever can it be available in e-prints who can see it etc and it does make a huge difference you have no control over your own your own intellectual property hmm. Definitely do we have anything on does it no. No. Nothing on Slido. Okay. Well, any other questions in the room? Okay. Well, I would like to um, say a sincere thank you to Robin for thank introducing you. us to some of these uh, interesting and new um, uh, ideas about how people work and how people will work. Um, and thank you very much for thank joining you. us today. Thank you and very much. Small gift on small Okay, so now we are. Let's see. Oh, we're on. Oh, we're on the first. Ah, there we go. Excellent. Great. Um, so, um, what we um, what we normally do on a, at a. Um, uh, QLOC ULs forum is is here from the university librarians, and this year we thought so. Last year. Was it last year that we gave them a short amount of time and we were terrible at keeping to time? So, <laughs> so this year we, we've decided to still give a short amount of time. But this year we thought that it would be really interesting to hear both from the mentors and the conveners of the working party. So we've got six of them. So we've got 12 people. Um, and we thought it was because it's it, there's so much of the work of QLOC is done through the working parties and the conveners do such a huge amount of work and they are the, the leaders in QLOC and we really thought it important to hear from them as well. So what we did was gave a challenge to each convener mentor um, partnership to present for five minutes only five minutes um, on some aspect of resilience. So we didn't tell them it had to be about resilience in terms of their working party or in terms of their working life, could be about their personal life, anything that they wanted to share with us. And we hope that we get six very different perspectives on resilience. So we're going to do this in alphabetical order. We'll still, Slido is still open. So if you've got a question or a comment for any of those partners as they come up and do their thing, um, feel free to put it, put it on Slido. So we're going alphabetically in order of the working party name. Um, so the first one is client contact points and spaces. So that's Kim Lewin and Julie Aslett um, from QUT and Griffith University um, respectively. So come on up. Um, So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kim Lowen from QUT, the mentor for this group, and Julie Aslett, who is the group convener. I thought we were first because Julie's name started with A, no. but we aren't. And so our resilient, is, well, because we are client contact points and spaces, we are going to talk about spaces, and we may even touch on what Robin was saying, where you've been told off in the library before and hopefully we have moved past that point. 
So libraries are more than just resilient on the outside. There's been lots of change, I think, to the to the mindset as well as the spaces and well as the services that we provide. So looking at our first slide, and, and these are slides from a number of universities that are in this working group, and we look at what we see are, are large desks, large cumbersome desks where we clearly stood on one side, the client stood on the other side, and service was delivered that way. They they went to more smaller desks to mobile desks to having no desks, where it was more of a conversation with our peers. And I think it was at this point that we really started to listen more to the client, that rather than being the gatekeepers, we became the enablers and we actually cared what our clients thought as opposed to telling them to be quiet and behave. So once we left the desk, we may have found our way upstairs to the collection or resources, but not so much anymore. We may have found our way to places like this. And at the end, after we moved all the shelves, we came to empty spaces. And so adapting our spaces to uh, what our students needed was very important. And also because of the electronic resources that we had with our collection, our physical collection shrunk. What were we going to do with all this room? We certainly didn't want to give it up to anybody else in the university. So we had to really find a, a, a different um, function for it. So we had opportunity to change and, um, and that made us, our, our spaces, very resilient. So from that, we also looked at other areas and we had to come up with ideas. And sometimes we just didn't have those budgets um, to, to get architects in, to get interior designers in. So librarians, as you know, we're very resilient people. We've become interior designers, we've become furniture experts. You know, you talk about rub rate, I'll be able to tell you about rub rate of fabric. Um, What's rub rate? <laughs> I'll tell you later, Kim. <laughs> Uh, so we've turned areas that were once collections into different types of study spaces. So next slide is we look more at our resilience due to technology and bring your own devices. So the, the commentary became around there's never enough PowerPoints, there's never enough Wi-Fi or connections, uh, never enough seats. So that also told us that even though we had lots of never enough, people still came into the space. They still wanted to be in the space. They were still attracted to it, even though it didn't tick all of their boxes. It was still their, their place of choice, either to meet, to study, collaborate, or whatever they were doing at that point in time. And they certainly wanted to collaborate and they wanted to do it in, in, different, uh, in different ways. It wasn't just sitting at a, a round table and talking. They wanted that lounge, that cafe type style. And they didn't want fixed furniture. They wanted it moved. We as librarians had to work out what not only what students wanted, but where they wanted it, how they wanted to use it, when they wanted to use it. And very importantly, why they wanted it that way. Um, so we looked at the way we used to use uh, use libraries and it was no talking, uh, no eating, no sleeping. Guess what? Talk, eat, sleep, drink, be merry. Uh, and please invite us. And so along with that came our opening hours. What did we do with those? Were they only there when we could operate? Could we do it differently? And that we did. We went from, you know, opening eight, nine o'clock in the morning till seven, ten o'clock at night to 24-7. And that meant opening up all of our spaces. Uh, students wanted a mixture of quiet spaces and collaborative spaces. Uh, they wanted, as Julie said, to be able to eat, talk and do a whole range of things. So. We all went uh, a little funky with our spaces. We created different uh, avenues, that flexibility. Lots of group spaces. Uh, James Cook that has a coffee shop and ice cream shop inside their library was a point of interest. Uh, 
we've, we've uh, from my opinion, we've started to come full circle again, where students now want us to be quiet. They can get funky collaborative spaces anywhere, uh, whether that be in at, at their home, in coffee shops, in, with clubs, etc. They now want us to go back to the shushing that we used to do so well. With that, actually, shushing, of course. Um, but what do you do with spaces that there's not too much uh, opportunity to actually move the form, but you move the function? And that's what we do here. This is um, Dixon Library, I think. Uh, and so, oh, is it James Cook? I do apologise. Sorry, it's James Cook. Sorry, James Cook people. Uh, so we went from study spaces to more collaborative spaces, to event holding, to engagement places bringing the communities of the university into the library spaces. So talking about that, we also looked at what we could also bring into our spaces for students. So we did things like human libraries. We brought music into our spaces. We collaborated with other parts of the university uh, and brought mentoring into our spaces. And we looked at, you know, what, what students needed. They needed areas for to de-stress. So we uh, gave them the opportunities to play games, do puzzles, uh, you know, do, do a lot of things that weren't traditional library. So for our spaces to keep resilient, we need to ensure that we seek student feedback, not only what their issues are or their concerns are, but also keep their voices in the conversation in determining the solutions to the problems and their involvement in the design of our services and our spaces. Da da, we are done. Thank you. Thank you very much. So next alphabetically is uh, the information and communication technology um, pairing. So that's a thank you. Um, so we've got um, Margie and Peter um, from Southern Cross and Bond. Okay, so I am not Sarah Fredline who's having a lovely holiday. So our university librarian has asked me to fill in and I'm the deputy convener. I'm the deputy convener on our working party um, and Margie is the convener. And so we decided that um, an important part of resilience is to keep your sense of humour. So we hope you like this lighthearted approach that we're going to take. Okay. I woke up in the morning. It's always good to be alive. Now for a bit of exercise before my morning drive. My early walk was cancelled because of heavy rain. I started doing yoga to loosen up the brain. The bamboo that bends is stronger than the oak that resists. My downward dog collapsed when the, the cat jumped upon my back. I threw out the door and had another crack. I launched into an asana and saluted the non-existent sun. My muscles started straining. Then my hamstring went bung. I limped towards the kitchen and tripped over on the rug. I sprawled upon the carpet, thinking I need a hug. Fall seven times, stand up eight. I scrambled to my feet and staggered to the door. I needed a bloody coffee. Usually I'd have four. The coffee pot was smoking and started smelling gross. I'd forgotten to put the water in and now my beans were toast. Forget the bloody coffee and get yourself to work. There was a crisis brewing. It was one I couldn't shirk. If you're going through hell, keep going. So there'd been a slight mishap that had happened overnight. My phone was going crazy. The messages had me turning white. The data center is on fire. The sprinklers are in use. Petabytes of data can't take this sort of abuse. It was only 7.30, my day had just begun. I limped out to my car. I wasn't having fun. The world breaks everyone, and afterward, some are strong at the broken places. I headed for the freeway to take the fastest route, my pedal to the metal. I rear-ended a bloody ute. I gave the dude my number, then stuck out my thumb, hoping against hope someone would come along. Life is a succession of lessons which must be lived to be understood. 
It came as some surprise, the VC's car appeared. Things weren't getting any better. This was my worst fear. No elevator pitch for me, instead a tale of woe, about bloody data centers and fires that just won't go. There are two ways of spreading light, to be the candle or the mirror that reflects it. Confessions around how, no contingency plan we had, and stories about other things that also had gone bad. They say, that which does not kill us makes us stronger. But at this very moment, I didn't want to live any longer. I hopped out of the car and thanked him very much. I approached the data center, the door still too hot to touch. There was a bit of damage. The prognosis was looking dire. It was obvious in looking, this was no average fire. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger? I wondered what else could go wrong. I hadn't read my email yet. I knew something else would come along. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. I opened up my outlook and scanned through the inbox, searching for a missive from the wise old research fox. A researcher of note was he with a reputation to boot. He'd entrusted to us his data and now it was kaput. Resilience is the ability to attack while running away. I hear you've had a fire, he said. I hope my data is secure. I haven't backed it up, you see, as I thought you would for sure. I searched the backup schedule to warrant my deep concern. There was no successful backup. He became somewhat taciturn. I broached the awkward silence. I had a plan, you see. We could send the hard drives off to a company in Sydney. Forget mistakes, forget failures, forget everything except what you are going to do right now and do it. Today is your lucky day. It would cost a bit of money, but they'd done this in the past. I needed to save my bacon or my job, it wouldn't last. I needed to placate him and keep my reputation intact. It wouldn't happen again, I said, I'd get his data back. Our prime purpose is to help others. And if you can't help them, at least don't hurt them. I was busy making promises, ones I hoped that I could keep. I felt myself sinking. I was getting in way too deep. The day was nearly over, thank the Lord for that. I still needed to get home to feed the bloody cat. I was feeling very frazzled as I opened my front door. My furniture was missing, a note left by the door. It said, here are the current details of the lawyer I've employed. Don't try to contact me directly. If you do, I'll get annoyed. Resilience is accepting your new reality even if it's less good than the one you had before. It came as some surprise to me. My marriage was at an end. To start out all over again, when you thought things were on the mend. There was only one way to go from here. It was mostly up, you see. A few little deviations on the road to full recovery. I've always been delighted at the prospect of a new day, a fresh try, one more start, with perhaps a bit of magic waiting somewhere behind the morning. And that's all. Well, that is a hard act to follow. <laughs> but follow it, they will. From Griffith, we have Maureen and Craig, information resources. Yep. Okay, fine. Okay, well, I'm obviously Maureen and this is obviously Craig. And we're just going to talk to you a bit about resilience in the context of the Working Party and in the context of Griffith, because we're both from Griffith. So Griffith's had um, a hectic year. I'm going to use that as my new term. We had a post um, information services uh, change for 28 years of information services and no longer information services. We also had a restructure in the middle of the year and four to six months without four key managers, but we now have new managers on board. Uh, we had a new VC in the wind, which meant our old VC was perhaps not as active as he could have been. And we also had the usual ongoing financial constraints and government policy uncertainty. So there was a lot of stuff happening, a lot of change, a lot of turbulence 
and therefore the need for a lot of resilience. So we want to talk about resilience in our world, which was about not just bouncing back, but bouncing forward, making the most of the opportunity. So we wanted to move forward with confidence of our expertise and our knowledge in our area that it was our accountability for the organisation. We wanted to talk about how we wanted to manage our tasks and our people um, in terms of the work that we do and also talk a little bit about how we manage ourselves, our work and our life um, and the life of our staff with integrity and care in a time of great change. So Craig's going to take over from here. So yeah, so I was going to just talk about a couple of things, I guess, from a from a Griffith perspective about particular projects. Um, I guess everyone in, in who works in the resource space will know that they need to have resilience, whether that's you know you're dealing with internal challenges uh, from your committees, your academics, um, your own even staff possibly, finance, university committees, um, and I guess the resilience also from external vendors, I guess, and also the. Um, the, uh, sorry. Um, Put your glasses on. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, committees, yeah, and I, and I guess that's sort of familiar situation that everyone will be facing. So there's, there's three one three examples, I guess, at Griffith I just wanted to talk about in terms of where we've had a lot of resilience, but we've been, I guess, bouncing forward and, and a bit sideways too. I discovered these little guys actually bounce forward sideways, which is Quite yeah, an they, interesting they little thing. Like that. Yeah, to the leaping, leaping emails. And so the first one, I guess, was the was the sort of the budget. So you know, despite having a, a resource budget, which um, you know, in 2017 across call we were ranked about 23 out of 46 in terms of the amount of money that we have. Um, on an FTE basis, we're actually 41 out of 46 people. So you know, so you can interpret that data in any in many different ways. But it hasn't stopped us from actually delivering what we need to deliver in the learning and teaching space or the research space. And that's been, you know, just through persistence in vendor negotiation and discussions with finance, where we're now actually in a position where we've got um, a position of budget certainty. And, um, you know, we're already looking at locking down our 2020 budget soon. So that's also going to let us, um, allows us to do the predictable spending and work strategically and invest strategically across the union. The next one I was going to mention is reading lists. I'm sure everybody has had fun with reading lists and resilience for reading lists goes across <laughs> everybody in the library, not just the resource people. Um, and that's been from, from my perspective and the teams, no doubt, from implementation uh, through to academic adoption, the agile, um, the agile way the vendor works in deploying and redeploying things overnight, which is which is great. Um, and the team themselves have been fantastic. They've been really agile. They've been really um, resilient. They've taken on new work. And, and in that as well, so we actually now are in a position as because of the way we've worked through it, we actually have a whole new set of data, which is going to let us move towards making more resources online next year through new data dashboards and engaging directly with course conveners, program directors, um, and hopefully I'll go and speak to learning teaching committee again. <laughs> um, and it, it's all about improving the student experience and working out what you've got and how you can do it. And it's not necessarily the obvious, the obvious there. In 2017, so this is another one. So I think last year, actually, someone did the poster on our interlibrary loan system. So, so it was called the temporary interlibrary loan solution while well, we switched to our new solution. It's still our interlibrary loan solution. So in our transition, we came across uh, some security concerns, which you know is the big, the big thing now. So we actually didn't get to switch over and we actually made the, we had the option to switch the old one back on and we went, you know what, that's, that's not a good way to go. So we didn't switch we it didn't back on. We didn't want to bounce back. Yeah. So, so what we have done is we've actually, we tweaked the, temporary solution a little bit, um, as much as we could. And we're now, actually, as a result of this delay, we may even take a completely different path in the next, you know, four or five months because other solutions have come to present themselves, you know. And we're talking about, like, doing things probably, you know, very different from before. So that's, so that was, I guess, the reading. So I think all those things have had challenges, but all those things we've moved forward, haven't really looked back. And nothing's really broken either. So um, you could go into all these stories forever. I thought I'd mention a couple of things that I think are useful for resilience. This, this little guy, 
<laughs> um, for all the what at the moment. So, you know, when I keep hearing about people building online courses with resources that you can only get in print, just give it a good little thing and focus on a solution. I've made I've, him cross yeah, out the yeah, people's faces. Yeah. I've got a few of these, by the way. Yeah. I mean, I'd rather be playing my bagpipes in the office, but apparently that's not allowed. So um, we took a vote. Yeah. So always focusing on the root cause of an issue. So that's like that is the thing. I just you just drill in the root cause, and it's going to take you. It's going to result in more work. You're going to need more time to achieve what you need to achieve, but and you'll need extra effort to get where you want to go. But at the end of the day. All the communication that's involved in delving through root cause and trying to work out things, all the communication with stakeholders leads to a much clearer understanding and a much better outcome in the long term. So it's all about opportunity, even when it's hard. And Kepner Trego stuff's really good for that, I find. Um, there's always a way forward. You just have to reprioritize what you're going to do. Um, Julie probably. I reprioritize a lot of things that I probably should have done for Julie by now, but anyway, that's all good. Um, <laughs> make bold and informed decisions and don't be scared of doing it. Um, you know, and don't don't just follow what other people are doing. Um, and don't take issues home. That's that's my big one. So I cut off my email as soon as I walk away from my desk. I don't look at it again until the morning. I'm back at my desk, you know, and I challenge anyone to do that for at least two weeks. You'll never go back. You'll enjoy your breakfast. You'll enjoy your home life. It's all very good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to say. Okay, really. so they're all examples of the, the sort of things that we've done at Griffith and some of the things that Craig does personally. And what I wanted to just finish on is, is the need to um, reflect on those things. So um, it's very important that when you're going through change and you're actually surviving, which in, this year has felt a bit like survival, that you actually go back and have a bit of a reflection. So. In reflecting on the year we've had and the things that we've done, and we've actually made um, enormous um, advances in our profile within the organisation and in our ability to actually deliver on the smell of an oily rag. Um, and um, it's been really great from that point of view. So the things that I wanted to reflect on is that problems present opportunities. Change presents opportunities. And if you focus on resolving the problem and working through the change at hand and be ready to leap at the opportunities that are presented, you can really make a difference and you can really um, model the type of behaviour that will help your staff be resilient because the hecticness and the change is not going to go away. So the other thing is um, reflect on the lessons, but don't dwell on them. Um, move past and move on and keep looking forward. The other big thing I wanted to reflect on was looking after your people. So acknowledge their struggles and frustrations, and we've done a lot of that. That's why I'm probably going to have to buy them another stress ball. Um, provide relief where you can. Um, support and provide options for things. Cheerlead. So I've done a lot of cheerleading this year um, to get us through. And when, an, when all else fails, we laugh. Um, so for us, resilience is the ability not only to bounce back, but to bounce forward. And at Griffith, we've taken the, the view that we would um, bounce forward very much on our own trajectory. So we would say what we owned and what we could do, regardless of what was going on around us. So that's really important. So the ability to acknowledge and promote our expertise, to step up and, and keep going. And just like these leaping lemurs of Madagascar, we have our tails up, our eyes forward, we're moving fast and nimble, and we're also moving together. So they're the reflections that we've had on resilience from this year and in this context. Thank you. Thank you, guys. That's awesome. We might just leave lemurs up for the next um, presentation. So the next one is Research Support um, Working Party. So this Working Party's um, done some great stuff this week and practically everything that you do is on YouTube now, isn't it, Sandra? Is that right? I think so. Um, so we've got Sandra and Kylie um, and they have props. <laughs> Pardon? No. Good look. 
Thank you. All right. So, Kylie, as I said, I'm so pleased that you suggested we come and have a talk about resilience today. Um, and you obviously, because of, I'm a little bit older than you, Kylie, or quite a bit older, and you obviously <laughs> recognise because of that I have a lot of life experience and knowledge and wisdom that I could share. But I'm sure that you, even as a young person, have valuable insights that you could also share. And I thought, Kylie, because it's just the two of us talking privately, <laughs> we could be really open with each other. So when I think about resilience, I think it's all about perspective and there are elements to that. So why don't we start with the issue of self-belief, because I think it's really critical if you're taking any action or trying to implement any change, that you have a really core belief in what you're trying to do, why you're trying to do it, and that you can explain that well to your staff and your colleagues and clients and the university generally. Um, and given that, even though I think sometimes I'm godlike, but even I sometimes have to acknowledge that I can't control everything. And some people are just going to be um, resistant no matter what, out of fear or self-interest or too much comfort, whatever. So I think you have to have that really core belief, but also acknowledge that maybe your power isn't all-consuming. Does that resonate with you, Con? It certainly does, Sandra. And thank you very much, and thanks very much for this private conversation. <laughs> sometimes my self-belief does waver, especially when I have setbacks, and, and sometimes when I'm faced with change in the workplace and having to do and learn new things. But I like to see uh, setbacks as an as a opportunity to rethink um, and maybe uh, think about a different path that I can take. And I, can, I also view uh, challenges um, as opportunities to grow. So um, unexpected paths lead me to unexpected opportunities. And even if you get a lot of no's, keep, keep pushing along and eventually you will get a yes. And Sandra, I'd like to know, do you find it helps to talk to colleagues when you're going through tough times? I do, actually. Um, I think it's really important to have maybe just two or three key people that you trust and, and you can speak to honestly, that you can vent with them, <laughs> um, and you know that they'll give you the moral support that you sometimes need. It's important, I think, because it just reinforces that you're not battling things on your own. You know, there's always that nice support network there. Have you got a good support network? Right? I certainly do, and I find uh, I find that I like to connect with people, and that helps me through tough times. It's I find that it's really useful to be open and re receptive, and really important to create a strong uh, network. Um, and having the colleagues, having close colleagues to help you through and get you through the good times and the bad times. It just makes the ride more enjoyable. And you don't feel so alone when you are going through those tough times. And most of all, it makes things fun. Yes, that's a really important point. 
I think I couldn't emphasise enough the importance of having a sense of humour, particularly the ability to, to laugh at the absurdity of some situations that we face. Um, <laughs> don't know what you mean. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, Carly, you may find this hard to believe, but sometimes I find myself in meetings with idiots. <laughs> I mean, they're not library people, obviously, <laughs> other people from the university. And some of the comments made are just from some parallel universe. And sometimes, really, I imagine I'm in an episode of Yes Minister or Utopia, you know? And it's at times like those that I think, if I couldn't laugh at this, I would go slowly insane or I would have to shoot somebody. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever felt the need to shoot anybody? <laughs> Every morning, Sandra. <laughs> But uh, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, I'd love to laugh with my colleagues, with my colleagues, not at my colleagues. <laughs> and I find humour uh, essential for navigating difficult situations, especially when we are faced with a constant stream of change in our workplace and in our profession. And humour, it helps me keep perspective. Um, it helps me bond with people and it also helps me to, it helps to ease conflict. Um, and I think that is very important. A lot of that leads on to one's health, isn't it? Like your physical health, your mental health and emotional health. Um, and, and obviously that is, is really critical. Um, one, one big tip I would give you, Carly, as an older person, is try to have some sort of life-threatening illness. <laughs> as, as long as you can survive it, of course. Um, so a few years ago, um, I had a brain aneurysm and I was in an induced coma for a couple of weeks and not expected to survive. But I miraculously did, you know, and here I am and you're having the benefit of my company today. <laughs> but going through an experience like that, uh, it certainly does focus one's mind on what's important in life. And one realises that a lot of the nonsense that goes on in the workplace is not important, but there are much better things to be concerned about. And I think it's really important to have that balance in your life to, to recognise that. Mm. Um, do you have maybe more moderate ways of staying healthy? <laughs> Life-threatening emergencies? I do have more moderate <laughs> ways of staying healthy. Well, on that note, Sandra, I actually went to a great workshop this morning that was held by three fabulous librarians, Claire, Jen and Nicole. Shout out to you guys. <laughs> and it was really heartening to hear that a lot of people do take their health seriously, their physical health and their mental health um, seriously as, as a part of being resilient to the changes in our workplace and in our life. And I certainly do uh, take that seriously. And it's really hard sometimes to, to prioritise those things. It's really easy to just put your work, uh, work priorities and your family priorities at the top and just to push those down to the bottom. But I really find it useful if you find something in your life that is your thing, the thing that's going to keep you physical, physically healthy and mentally healthy, and you make that a non-negotiable and you don't feel guilty about doing it. So mine is running and I, I certainly carve out those three or four hours a week that it takes to do that and I don't feel guilty about it. In fact, I've learned that a lot of librarians do really like running. So Sandra, how about you and me, we start a running club. I, th I think we've covered enough now, Kylie, <laughs> really. Well, why don't we just go back and reiterate what we've done? Um, to a moderate person. <laughs> so what we've looked at, Kylie, this afternoon is the importance in terms of perspective of self-belief, a really good support network, sense of humour, and looking after one's health in whatever way. Kylie, do you think we've nailed it? Absolutely. Cheers I to that. Cheers to us. <laughs> I think they did nail it. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so moderation is what I've heard. 
um, and running is not essential um, <laughs> for everybody. Um, so next we have um, the teaching and learning support group. So we've got Catherine and I don't know if Fides is online, isn't she? Yes, excellent. Wonderful. So, Fidesz, would you like to begin? Oh, thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Can, can people hear me? Yes. Uh, you can hear me. Can you see me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thanks so much. And firstly, my apologies for not being able to join you in person. Um, I had uh, a few meetings here today, so I could not travel to Queensland. I'm based in North Sydney. Um, as uh, already has been mentioned, Catherine and I are from the Teaching and Learning Support uh, Group. Catherine is convener. I'm supposed to be the mentor, though that reverse, there's always a reversal in that function, in that role. I am grateful and I benefit from the shared wisdom of everybody in the working party, especially Catherine, particularly for these presentations. Um, I think Catherine and I, when discussing these considered strategies for building resilience from a personal and work perspective and identified strategies, uh, practical suggestions uh, which we see applying at work and perhaps to our personal lives. So there's a lot of similarity in strategies. Um, first, uh, before I uh, continue, I'd like to thank uh, Robin because uh, her definition of um, resilience in her presentation earlier was quite appropriate, I think, to what we, Catherine and I are about to do. She talked about a dynamic process encompassing positive adaptation within the context of significant adversity. So what you'll hear from us, uh, particularly from my, my bit, um, is about those dynamic uh, positive adaptation to adversity. I'll speak about mental and physical fitness. Um, and hopefully the, the strategy, uh, and Catherine will talk about support networks and how asking for help is a positive sign of resilient behavior. What we hope is that you will be able to relate to these strategies and find some applications at work and maybe even in your personal situation. Um, so I, should I go first, Catherine, or should, would you? Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, we've got one slide each, I think. Um, so we often talk about uh, keeping mind and body uh, fit. I think the, the previous group uh, talked about keeping, uh, um, you know, developing your mental, working on your mental and physical health. So that's a nice segue to this slide. So what do I see as mental fitness in a work sense? Um, in light of uh, Robin's definition, particularly. It's, I think at work it's important, I'm talking about mental fitness first, it's important to be informed, not to be blindsided, uh, to be aware. So how do we do that? Uh, I think we need to keep informed about what's happening within our institutions, within our sector, uh, but as Robin pointed out quite rightly, what's happening with our competitors, not only the competitors to library services, the competitors to the universities that we work in. Um, in, and changes in government, we need to be aware about changes in government. There's been an election in Victoria. We've had so many federal uh, leadership changes and we need to be aware um, of what are the policy regulatory changes that affect our work. And one other way of uh, being aware and being informed is uh, to actively network, uh, not just within our institution, but to people outside uh, outside our usual spheres of, spheres of influence. It's amazing, uh, with networking, it's formal and informal is what I have in mind. It's always amazing to me what I find out over coffee, over a shared meal, um, a shared um, bottle or two glasses of wine. Um, I think it's important that, as we do at UT, at ACU, um, get yourself and staff 
in university-wide working groups, in various committees in the university and in projects because you really pick up a lot of information about the things that we in the library need to, need to learn about, need to know about in supporting the university. Um, I am the national director of uh, ACU Library, so there's seven campuses in Australia and one in Rome. In that kind of context, it's very difficult to cover everything that you need to be aware of. So I am really grateful to my colleagues in our campuses particularly because they are further great sources of inf information and knowledge. Uh, they are our eyes and ears on the ground. Um, so that's one other way of being aware, keeping informed and being knowledgeable. Um, once, uh, of course, once you gather all that information, it's important to organize it and share it and make it accessible to, to relevant people in your, within your institution, within the library. That helps to inform decisions, service redesign, and I think that also strengthens us to face uh, adversities uh, that we are confronted with. Um, I also am a great believer in giving priority to our staff. So I think that's been mentioned in a number of uh, sessions today. Um, the knowledge and skills of our staff uh, helps us as an institution to, again, face the adversities that come our way. Um, in ACU, we recently talked about addressing the increasing the uh, digital literacy of the staff across all levels in the library. Uh, the next thing that I'd like to mention is uh, the planning. The planning is something that we do once we have all the information, but even that, I would like to see that. Um, I see that as a fluid fluid situation. We at ACU just came out of our planning day, uh, and I've always mentioned that the plan is not something that's set in stone. Um, but we need to keep track of, keep mindful of our uh, long-term goals and the core values that we, we have. Um, and response, responsiveness. The response is in this context, the ability to make a decision and take action. And I think something, thing, something to bear in mind is the timeliness of our decision is, can be critical. Many years ago, I was visiting the University of Southern California. They're a well-founded institution. And the university librarian told me that he received millions of dollars. 10 million is the thing that I remember, but it could have been, it mightn't have been correct, the, the exact date amount, but he said he was approached by a potential donor. They had already approached another Ivy League university. The Ivy League, the other, uh, the first uh, university they approached could not make the decision uh, quickly enough. So the university librarian said, I'll take it, I'll take it now, I can, I can take action now. So, you know, the, the timeliness of the decision allows us to uh, grab opportunities and could be uh, a slowness in that could result in opportunities and positional advantages being lost. Um, if you don't have all the information that you need, I also, uh, we believe in trialing, piloting and learning from that. And then the last thing there is review, the preparedness to review, realign, reprioritize. And the realigning uh, could be within a budget, even though you can't necessarily increase your entire budget. But reprioritizing and real reallocating resources, I think it's terribly important in the way we uh, adapt to, in that positive adaptation to adversity as part of that institutional resilience. Physical fitness, or oh, we have heard a lot about physical fitness. It could be running, it could be yoga. Uh, in my case, I do both. I do swimming and, um, you know, taking, taking care of yourself and taking care of your staff um, and providing a, an environment in which they can, they can thrive. And I think that self, self uh, the personal level of fitness is terribly important in our resilience. Um, November 21 was go home on time day. We've often heard people pride, proudly talking about how long they can work, how long they work. But I think we need to move on to appreciating resting and sleeping um, and also, um, you know, the benefits of all of that. So a time for chilling, I think, um, both at the personal and, um, and organizational um, context, I think it's very important. Take care of the work environment. We need to have systems, uh, IT, financial structures and processes um, that are uh, fluid. We need to be uh, 
we have to have mental agility uh, is um, what I think about in all of these, in our processes, in our systems, so that they are, uh, we keep them fit for purpose. Um, hopefully they are all current and robust. Um, in terms of our physical infrastructure, I think it was the first group that talked about the space that we use. Um, one of the things that I remember was I visited a public library in, in Scandinavia uh, a few years ago. They actually had movable internal walls. Uh, and I, I really admire that because it allows you to reconfigure the space that you have. Um, British Library has a wonderful example of digital signage, which are not as complex. And I think they give us the ability to be flexible in responding to what whatever happens and changing needs and changing demands. Finally, like the preceding group, I, I would like to talk about um, we need to celebrate and mark milestones. Um, and we do this together. It's important because that's good for uh, our ability to both uh, respond to personal and uh, work challenges. Um, and in all of that, both sides of the slide that you're looking at, I hope that we develop, um, through all of this, we develop uh, an ability to not only respond, but to anticipate um, developments and respond accordingly. So thank you. And um, I, I, over to uh, Catherine for her, her chosen topics. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Fidesz. Um, so I've just picked one aspect of resilience that I want to talk about. And um, Carly and Sandra also touched on this, which is about support networks and asking for help. So I just believe that one of the most important factors in building resilience, both whether you're at home or at work, is having really good social support and, and a strong network. So you need to be able to build relationships with your family, with your friends, and with your colleagues um, to be able to access strong support, uh, support community. And when we faced, as we are, are all every day, with stress or adversity, what we need to do is develop the self-awareness to recognize that we need help and also the self-confidence to actually ask for that help. This is actually really quite difficult because we don't want people to think that we are weak or we are incapable of doing what we need to do. But something you should always ask yourself is, how do you feel when somebody asks you for help? How do you feel about them? How do you feel about yourself? Generally, you don't actually look down on someone who's asking you for help. You sometimes actually feel quite grateful because you think, oh, thank goodness, someone else is also having difficulty and they also need help in life. So you actually feel a little bit better about that. And you can also feel quite good in yourself to think that they trust you enough to actually um, come and ask you for that assistance. Um, asking for help also gives you the opportunity to learn from other people's experience because generally the issues that we have are not unique. A lot of people have um, had them in the times before. And also when you're asking for help, you can probably get a different perspective, especially if you're asking for that help from someone who is not within your close circle or someone that you work closely with, because they may actually be able to give you a completely different idea about how to resolve some issues that you may have. So some of the help that we can ask for um, is emotional support, as Kylie and Sandra so come carefully put it basically, is having somebody who can just listen, who's not going to be judgmental when you need to just unload. Um, reassurance, so asking people to give you feedback on your work or practical advice. So if there's a new technology that you're unfamiliar with, just asking somebody to be able to help you with that. And in order to actually ask for help and making it easier to ask for help, it, it's useful to have a really strong network. So we can build our networks by being active in our wider community, being a team player, and also learning how to give support and ask for support. And finally, I'd just like to say we all have a role to play. Um, if you can show kindness and compassion when other people are asking you for help, you can actually expect the same when you're asking other people for help. And in that vein, I would like to ask for help from Carmel to say, can we please change the name of our group to the acceptable um, teaching and learning support group so that we don't have to be last when it comes to these things again. Because <laughs> everyone else gave great presentations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much um, to Fidesz and Catherine for that. And no, you can't change your name because you're not actually last. The, pe the people who are last are workforce and organisational development. So you're second last. <laughs>
um, and sometimes it's good to be last. It's just that's who people remember. Um, so we've got Blanca and Sue from um, Workforce and Organisational Development to be lucky last. Well, I'm going to talk today and I'm going to say that um, mentor it happens in both ways because Sue is my mentor too. Uh, I'm Blanca, I'm probably here um, as a new university librarian. I've been in the role for one year and I'm going to talk about my experience. But I think it's uh, important to know about all the people, amazing people uh, around you, like in my team, uh, I have Sue and Claire and the whole team. It's been amazing how much I have learned from them too. I mean, so I'm a mentor for that group, but it, it's also the other way around. And uh, probably I'm going to talk a little bit about my, my personal experience. Um, I started to manage libraries around 15 years ago, and I didn't have any experience at all. Even I wasn't a manager when I went to uh, be in charge of libraries. I Means I was very lonely and initially it was all fun. I had this great job, uh, but I didn't have the tools. I didn't have the networks. It was very lonely and it started to be very difficult. Um, I started to suffer things uh, mentally, couldn't sleep, uh, couldn't solve problems. I Means I had to develop uh, strategies to deal with these cases and they are relevant today and that was 15 years ago and it always happened and the key things is that we keep practicing and you are always new uh, but you start to learn about those things networks are key uh, something that i learned is that also you need to um, balance your life your work life and also your personal life um, you can keep going 24 hours with problems from work, you have to leave them. And one of the strategies that I have applied is meditation. I have um, um, a rule that I have to do 10 minutes every night to switch off and think about the great things that happen. So how can I solve a problem? Problem solving is a key thing in, in resilience to learn how to, pro to solve problems learn about yourself. Emotional intelligence was something that it helps me. The more I learn about it, the more I learn about myself, I learn about other people. Uh, it has helped. It's a great strategy. Learn how you feel on the day, how to deal with things. It's been a key thing. It's emotional intelligence is a very powerful uh, strategy. And I think to be kind uh, to the rest of people, uh, it plays a big, a big role. Uh, people are not bad, things happen. Having good communication and discussion with people, be honest and trust, and trust people around you is, is key, or has been a key um, factor for me uh, in, in, my key, in my current role and also before. With, um, I think be kind and be passionate about what you do is just key. Thank you. And I, didn't, I didn't have a presentation and uh, I should be the last one. Can you now <laughs> move us? <up? laughs> so they want to be um, something. Uh, what would that be called? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> adaptable workforce and organisational development perhaps. Um, so um, that brings us to the um, to the end of the um, convener mentor presentations and we were slightly worried that we'd get six groups just to say all exactly the same things. We did get quite a lot of range there in those groups so that was fabulous. I think what I've learnt is I have to turn email off, I have to go home from work on time, get a good amount of sleep, avoid running at all costs and drink more champagne. I think that's what I've, <laughs> that's what I've learned. That's what I'm taking home from today. Um, I want, we've got a few thank yous before we move out to drinks and um, nibbles. Um, firstly, to thank you to QUT for hosting. QUT um, has hosted, we just love being here. The, 
the Cube is a fantastic place to hold an event um, and we've done it um, many times. So thank you very much um, to QUT. Um, to the UL's committee, thank you so much for your support this year as I stumble my way through my first year as um, convener. Um, to all the conveners and mentors for the working parties and the practitioner group members, as I said before, you are the heart and soul of QLOC. What QLOC does is really unique in Australia. There really isn't, Woggle is a little bit like QLOC, but not as good. Um, <laughs> but, but what QLOC does is really powerful. It's really practical. It's really collaborative. And I think it's something that we should be very, very proud of. Um, and I'm really proud of the work that all those working parties do. Um, We've got posters out there from, and we've got poster makers to thank from ACU, Bond, um, Charles Darwin, Griffith, QT, UQ, USQ, and the State Library, as well as our Indigenous Strategy Reference Group has a poster out there. Um, so I highly recommend taking a good look at those posters. Um, Sarah Bader, up particularly for all the design work she's done, and I think you'll agree that QLOC logo and all the assets that go with that are really fantastic. She's done all that work um, for us um, out of the goodness of her heart. And Sarah Fredline has supported her to do that. We do have a small, we know that neither of them are here, but we're, we've got a small gift for the Bond people to take back and we'll tell her that she should expect a gift that you can't, <laughs> you can't disappear on the way back to Bond. Um, <laughs> and then there's one more person to thank. Um, that is Rachel. Um, this is Rachel's last um, time as the executive officer for a QLOC ULs forum. She has been, and uh, you would all know that the person who does all the work is Rachel. So the person who is QLOC is Rachel. And I'm really grateful for her. She has a, she's guided me through the process of being the convener. She's got a great sense of humour. Her job title really should be just UL Wrangler, I think. And that's a very difficult job. Um, so I've got a small gift for Rachel. Not two small gifts, actually. <laughs> So now, with, without any further ado, thank you, everybody, and you can move out to drinks and nibbles. Yes. Nothing at all? Yep, excellent. Thank you.